Welcome, willkommen. Ja, ich hätte Ingo. Uh, and uh, today I'm sharing a very important topic with you. I will introduce it, introduce it, then pray with you. The topic of health, and I talk, I call it in German Gesundheit. I I don't know if you uh, use that term in Norway. No. They they do in America. You sneeze here in America, and somebody will say, "Well, bless you." Usually, but people will also say "Gesundheit." They don't even know that it's a German term, and "Gesundheit" means health. Else, uh, there are a couple of reasons behind my talk on health today one is a personal one and the other is another personal one i'm invited to speak at a health conference and it helps me to go through a talk several times and i delete things i add things i realize it once again it's too long too much information should be a two part series but i was given 30 minutes here in texas to speak on health it will take me probably 45 50 minutes today and then uh this week, I will cut it down. But the other reason why I'm presenting on health is a very personal one. In December, I woke up from a nap at my age. We need naps. And I had a chest pressure, not a pain, cold sweat. I got up to get a drink of water and I was dizzy. I thought I was going to pass out. Felt really bad. I looked pale. Um... And this happened several times. Finally, my wife said, I, I need to take you to the hospital. And uh, I said, yeah, we, we better go. And I, I thought I was not going to make it. I got in the car. I had to get back out. I was so sick. Then got my wife telling me, Nancy, get back, back, get back in the car. We need to go to the emergency room. And uh, there, there's an enzyme troponin that goes up when your heart is in distress and might get damaged. And, and those enzyme numbers went up. So they kept me three days. And I'm now doing cardio rehab. The cardiologist, I did angiogram, echogram, lab work, hormone levels, everything, everything tested. And everything is looking good. And it's in the green zone. Um, and, and the cardiologist said, you, you cannot have a heart attack. You have clear veins. You live healthy. Um, said, yep, I walk almost every day. I try to manage my stress. I, I practice those seven plus eight doctors that I will talk about today. New start, nutrition, exercise, water, Sunshine, temperance, rest, fresh air, and trust in divine guidance. I might have left one out. That's very important. You include include God in your well-being. And I try to follow that daily. And so the nurses and the doctors were really puzzled. It happened again on the exercise bike while I was hooked up to an EKG. I thought, oh, I feel bad. I have to stop. And, and they called the cardiologist and I heard him say on the phone, uh, continue exercising. He cannot have a heart attack. But it was diagnosed as myocardiac infarction. Totally bizarre. It scared the friends around me. And I got two types of reactions. Uh, some friends said, see, living healthy doesn't work. Look at Ingo. <laughs> Look what happened to him. A and the other friends were scared, said, if this happens to Ingo, it can happen to any of us. So, well, as a personal information, but I'm sharing this with you, why I have a keen interest in health, always did. I was a biology major in high school in Germany. I took the medical entrance exam in Germany, studied for it, went to a seminar, passed, uh, not with the highest grade, but, and I was almost ready to go to medical school, 
but then switch to theology, the, the other aspect of well-being. So what I would like to do today is present to you a spiritual dimension of well-being and healthcare. I'm going to use the word holistic, but I'm very careful with that because uh, with all this natural healthcare, you are very swiftly drifting into new age and yoga and, and all that. And I want to avoid that. But I want to give you a perspective on healthcare. You might not have thought about why Jesus healed. How did he do it? Who did he healed, heal? What happened there? And, and then some practical advice that I'm not just preaching. I'm, I'm practicing and trying to follow now more consciously than ever. So I'm going to uh, pray with you and then we'll jump right in. Gesundheit, the spiritual dimension of healthcare. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for life. Such a precious gift. We can see most of us. We can hear with two ears. We can speak, feel, touch, experience love, express love, think. We, we thank you for how you have created life and how we can perceive life. We pray for health. And not selfishly for ourselves. We pray for a health ministry for the world that we can actually help people with simple methods and remedies. Keep us healthy for that purpose. We surrender our lives to you. And I want to include everyone sick who's watching right now. Maybe it's just a cold, a runny nose, sniffles some aches and pains, or something serious. I want to specifically pray for healing and comfort, forgiveness, restoration. Your gospel in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In a, a, an old commentary on the life of Christ called The Desire of Ages, page 824, the author Ellen White writes, quote, the very essence of the gospel is restoration. The very essence of the gospel is restoration. And I've experienced uh, that restoration in my own personal life. There was a rich king who uh, bragged that he could buy anything with his money, anything in the world with his money. A wise man listened to that and respectfully said, Your Majesty, King, there are four things that money cannot buy. The king got curious, not furious, just curious, and said, What is that? And uh, the wise man said, Well, you cannot buy the smile of a baby. You cannot buy the genuine love of a good woman. You cannot buy youth in old age. And you cannot buy health. Now, at that last statement, um, healthcare is very expensive. I'm, I'm getting the bills from the hospital. You can buy health care, but health in old age, especially, you, you cannot just purchase. There's a Chinese wisdom that says, long time ago, our doctors are paid when we stay well, and we stop paying them when we get sick. Interesting concept. Right now, it's the other way around, even though we have more well care visits now than, than in years past. There's a concept in the Old Testament 
called shalom. It's probably the number one Hebrew word outside of Shabbat, where you can put those two words together that you know in Hebrew, Shabbat, shalom. The other Hebrew word you probably know is rabbi. But this word, uh, Shabbat, shalom, what do we mean by it? It's not just a greeting. Shalom is not just peace. I want to read you from a dictionary the meaning of shalom. This is a Kohlenberger. I'll, I will switch to my document here in a minute, but uh, I'll wait till we get to the Bible text. Definition of shalom. Peace, safety, prosperity, well-being, and actness, intactness, wholeness. Peace can have a focus of security, safety, which can bring feelings of satisfaction, well-being, and contentment. And the German word for contentment, great term. We're very concrete and descriptive. Zufriedenheit. Zufriedenheit. It is the state of being at ease and in peace in your life. I've prepared a one-page document. Uh, I have it available in German as well. And I think you can see that. I might switch back and forth here and there. But what I'm proposing is seven premises, um, maxims, mottos, realities. And with those seven premises comes seven promises. Several Bible texts here, how holistic and integrative the Bible is, and, and the Bible considers the whole being. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, your teeth, for example, they, they affect your heart. They affect your mind. You, you cannot just check your teeth, make sure your teeth are okay. They, they affect more than just that single item. I worked in a hospital one time, a lady came in with a stomach pain and they did quite a few diagnostic tests. And uh, she came three times into the emergency room. And I jokingly said, she's probably not in front of her, but I told the doctor who was scratching his head, I, I jokingly said, she's probably pregnant. And it startled him. They had looked at everything about stomach pain and, and missed that she might be pregnant. He got in the intercom with the nurse's station saying, can you uh, do an EPT uh, pregnancy test on patient number so-and-so? She was pregnant and she was happy about it. Now they still had to check why there was a stomach pain, but it, it's that looking at the whole person, what is happening in their lives. And the Bible does that. And the most famous, I think, health care verse we quote, is a great promise, but there's a problem with us. It is Exodus, second Moses book, uh, chapter 15, verse 26. I, the Lord or Jehovah, am your healer. The promise. And if you follow me, then I will not put the diseases, God says, of the Egyptians and the surrounding nations on you. Uh, archaeologists have found that mummies had suffered strokes, heart attacks, cancer. They had cavities. Uh, they saw a Western civilization diseases in those mummies. And God says, you follow me. I will not put those diseases on you because I, Jehovah, I am your healer. Now, what is the problem? The problem is the condition. Do we follow God's laws? And then there comes a technical discussion. I'm studying that myself. Which ones? Okay. We like to claim the promise. But are we following the premise, the condition? The, there are really invitations by God. You, you live this way and I will protect you from these surrounding cultural diseases. Psalm 38, verse 3, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. Now, let me make something clear. Number one, sin causes 
sickness. But not all sickness can be traced directly in a, in a linear way to sin. We have a couple examples. Uh, one famous one, John chapter 9. There's a blind man and the disciples ask, so who sinned? He or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. But we are going to demonstrate the glory of God in this man. So not all sickness comes directly from your sin. Okay, Very careful in differentiating that. But, but sin causes sickness and suffering. Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The human body, so intricate and detailed. Proverbs 3, verse 7 through 8, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Very important verse because now we see i read it again. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. It will be health to your bones and strength to your body. I want to look at you. This is why the Advent movement has a health message. Did you catch the word fear the Lord, depart from evil? That is the second command in the first angel's message in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Fearing God departing from evil and experiencing health in your life are connected. That is what I mean by holistic and integrative direct connection. Again, between fearing God, respecting God on a profound level and departing from evil in your life and experiencing health, those Three elements go together, and they are a core part of the three angels' message that, according to verse 6 in Revelation 14, needs to go not to a church, but needs to go to the entire world. We'll go back to more text here. Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. I was at a grocery store and in front of me was a guy very impatient and, and the lady was grumpy and snapped back at him. And then it was my turn. And I thought, let me, let me try something here. I talked nicely to her, asked how she was doing. And there's days like that. And I'm, I'm sorry for the previous customer. And, and she softened and, and anger turned into sweetness and and yeah i'm having really difficult day and, and my mother at home and the kids and this and um unfortunately i have to admit i have not always practiced this wisdom here pleasant words it, you speak back sharply and the response is is sharp but try it sometime next time you're frustrated or so and you're with somebody uh Drop down your tone a little, add sweetness to it, calmness and patience. It helps in interrelational dynamics. Proverbs 17, verse 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. I have experienced this. I'm sure we all have negative experiences. They, they don't just affect your mind. They affect your body. You can feel it. it. It hurts your immune system. Acts 15, verse 11, and then 28 to 29. Acts 15, 11, 28 to 29. Let me explain what's happening here. In Acts 15, 18, the Jewish leaders make it clear that the Gentiles are saved by faith. Martin Luther added that word alone to it, we are saved by faith. We are saved through faith by his grace, really. That's more accurate. But it is our faith in what he's offering to us, period, end of discussion. Well, even righteousness by faith, then the leader said, the Gentiles need to do four things or 
not do four things. So it's very interesting. We are establishing righteousness by faith in Acts 15, 11, or confirm it. But then they say, we also need to change our behavior. And three of those four laws deal with health and affect our health. What we eat, how we eat it, uh, our male-female relationships, purity, abstinence, honoring God in that regard. But also that if we do eat meat, clean meat, the blood needs to be drained. There's a professor at Andrews University who argues that when you go to a restaurant, not judging you, just articulating something here to think about, just think about it. If you're a meat eater, if you're eating meat in a restaurant, you don't know if that blood was properly drained. That means plain eating meat is a violation of New Testament law because you cannot assure that you're following the counsel of Acts chapter 15. Interesting to me, the Gentiles, okay? Our current theology is faith, Jesus loves you, and that's it. And then we, as Adventists, we introduce Sabbath and all the other things, but it's, we're saved by faith. In the first Jerusalem council here, Act 15, they added behavioral lifestyle changes that affect our health as a package in addition to faith. Uh, that's amazing, isn't it? Think about it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. We quote this in a health context, but it is actually about purity between a male and a female. I'll let you read that yourself. I'm going to read the text here. And, and this is where Paul says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We use it for the health message, and that is okay. It is technically speaking about sexual purity. But here's the text. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So your physical body, it is about your physical body belongs not to yourself. It is on loan from God and he is the author and finisher of our faith and the creator of this body. So he has the rights to publish a manual on it and how we ought to live and what we should do and not do. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Then we have a summary of Jesus, what he did. Matthew 4, 23 to 25, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching, number one, in the synagogues, appealing to the mind and the brain, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, appealing to the mind and the heart, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. I want to pause here and look at this verse. It says, Jesus went about all Galilee. Now that is ministry. A lot of Christian ministry is inviting people to a place, a church, a program. What Jesus did here is he went to where the people are. Not just a building, a church is a building, but he, he, he went out into the world as a missionary and performed those three actions, preaching, teaching, and healing. And he did that among the people. Premise number two, Jesus himself practiced whole person care. Why did Jesus heal? Why did he do it? Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, quote, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you whole. I have homework for you. Matthew 9, 22. If you have a computer program or several Bibles in your home, compare the translations 
of Matthew 9.22 to one another. Your faith has made you whole. The Greek word here is sozo. There's even a book published with that title. Sozo. The English Standard Version, New American Standard uh, Bible, New King James, and the Net Translation have made you well. The NIV has healed. And the new John MacArthur Legacy Standard Version translates sozo in Matthew 9.22 as saved. Now, wait a minute. Think about that. One Greek word, several translation possibilities. Healing and saving is expressed both by this one term. Let, let me give you an example. I taught Greek for almost 20 years as a college professor, and I used Mounts' textbook, Bill Mounts, William Mounts. He's probably the number one Greek professor in the English-speaking world. He wrote a dictionary. And I'm going to just read you fast the dictionary entry for sozo. Okay, are you ready? Here it is. To save, rescue, to preserve, safe and unharmed. Several Bible texts given. To bring safely to, to cure, heal, restore to health. To save, preserve from being lost. To deliver from, set free from. To rescue from unbelief, convert. To bring within the pale uh, the realm, the territory of saving privilege, to save from final ruin, to be brought within the pale of saving privilege, that's a repetition, to be in the way of salvation, heal, rescue, save. So let me just say it plainly, what I think is happening in the healings of Jesus. When Jesus heals, he also wants to save. Put differently, because Jesus is able to heal, he's also communicating to the person healed, I can not only heal you here on earth now, I can heal you forever and save you forever in eternity. That is the reason, I think, why Jesus healed people. He didn't just create a bunch of vegans on their way to hell. Is that uh, formulated a little crass? But, but it's true. Uh, you can be very healthy and vegan and, and not have eternal life. So Jesus used the health message, his healing ministry, as an immediate invitation and bridge to eternal life and his kingdom. The premise is the Bible is holistic and integrative and so is Jesus. He considers the entire person. And when he heals the body, he's communicating that I want to save you for eternity. Does that make sense? Healing and saving go together. Step four. This is a a favorite of mine. I, I learned this from a professor at Andrews in Jerusalem, and, and it, it, it made sense. What am I talking about? How did Jesus heal? The first direct miracle that is a, a case study, so to speak, that we encounter after the Sermon from the Mount, that is the theory, that is the, uh, the manifesto of his kingdom, Matthew 5 through 7. Then we have a demonstration of his theory. Jesus didn't just preach, he practiced what he preached. And in the first healing, we have a leper. There's a debate in the scientific community among scholars, was that really leprosy or was that Hansen's disease, which was, by the way, discovered by, I think, a Norwegian. Um, that's why it's called Hansen's disease. But let's say he had leprosy. It is a contagious disease. It is horrible. It affects the nerve endings. You don't even know that you're stepping on broken glass. And then it becomes an illustration of sin. You don't even know that you're sin sick. But what does Jesus do? The lepers are supposed to yell, unclean, unclean, so that you stay away from them. 
What does Jesus do? Jesus, Matthew 8, verse 3, Jesus put out his hand and touched him. You don't want to do that. It's exactly what Jesus does. He heals by touching. And then we have uh, this commentary in Desire of Ages, page 271, that there's a disease worse than leprosy. Physical disease, I'm quoting, however malignant and deep-seated, was healed by the power of Christ, but the disease of the soul took a firmer hold upon those who closed their eyes against the light. Leprosy and palsy, paralysis, were not so terrible as bigotry, hypocrisy, and unbelief. Here again, we have an example of Jesus saying, if I can heal a leper, I can heal you, if you let me, of your bigotry, hypocrisy, and unbelief. But here comes a, a beautiful moment, and I hope this makes sense to you. Matthew 8, verse 13, we have another healing. What did he do in the first healing? Matthew 8, verse 3, he touched a leper. Now what does he do? Matthew 8, 13. Only speak a word. That's what the centurion says. His, his servant was healed. I think it was a centurion. I have to check that. His servant was healed that very hour. hour. Now let's talk face to face. What's going on here? Let me go the scenic route. The Gospels were written for a generation, really, that would have no longer the physical presence of Jesus, nor the physical presence and eyewitnesses of the ministry of Christ. Does that make sense? Peter, James, and John would all die one day, and there would be a generation of people, a world that has no more contact to the physical presence of Christ or the physical presence and eyewitness reports of the apostles. What would they have to rely on? Stories that were spoken and then written down. How does Jesus heal in the second miracle in, in the Gospel of Matthew, and very prominently so in the Gospel of John? He touches, and what else? He speaks. Why is that so important? That means there, there's a master. Jesus says, I will go to your servant and heal him, maybe by touching him. And the, and the master says, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. That might create a rebellion or a commotion. If you just speak the word, my servant will be healed. Now that is faith. What happened? The servant was healed that very hour. What's going on here? The word of Christ is as powerful and effective as his physical presence. Jesus can facilitate a healing without his physical presence. That means we're at no disadvantage. We just need his word. That is why Bible study, prayer, meditating upon his word is so powerful. You're not just a good little Christian. And uh, read your Bible every day, Bibelin. And, and, and no, no, you're exposing yourself to the very word, that the witness of the word that healed people long distance. Jesus did not have to be physically present to heal somebody somewhere else. Wow, that's amazing. Really, praise God. So the, the message is, back to my document. Uh, incidentally, um, print is really going out of style in the year 2024. And, and my goal really is to have a more attractive website for the world out there without internal church squabbles and to have an app. Uh, I was just recently in Europe for a quick trip to see my parents, and I noticed the world is on their cell phones. And I myself and the Advent movement has very little presence directly on the cell phone. YouTube channels, of course, but um, 
So my my one page papers here, small print, that they're scripts for future technological development to put better into the hands of the world. On a side note, the healing power of Christ is not limited to his physical presence. Well, wow. that is what Matthew and especially John is demonstrating. By the way, the Gospel of Luke, Luke was a medical doctor. Um, and the Gospel of Luke is very medically oriented. Luke speaks of therapeutic in Greek. Therapeutic. You know more Greek than you think you do. Therapy. He uses that verb. And he doesn't just talk about a bed that somebody picks up when they're healed. It's a clinician, a, a clinic bed. He uses medical language, medical language. And uh, he has about six very specific miracles not found in Matthew or Mark. And five of those miracles are medical miracles. Jesus' word is as good as his touch. Now, we want to see who did Jesus heal, a, a case study so to speak. And we have the worst case scenario in Mark chapter 5, verse 26. Mark 5, 26, the woman, quote, had suffered many things from many physicians. And they were probably all men in a intimate and personally embarrassing disease for a long time. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So difficult to picture, but uh, blood flow, not pleasant, um, embarrassing, socially ostracized, excluded, uh, embarrassing. And, and then she goes to doctors who's supposed to help and they don't help. Luke softens this statement, by the way. Very interesting. He protects protects his profession. Mark is pretty harsh on the doctors and says he, she went to the doctors. It, it went, it made it worse and it cost money, all her money. So she went from worse to worse, hopeless. Then there's a glimmer of hope in verse 28 where she thinks if I may touch, here's touch again, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And, and now comes a pro progression that is fascinating. Don't miss this. Okay, verse 25, society says a certain woman. She doesn't even have a name. It's like the woman at the well, John 4. Nicodemus had a name. Nicodemus came. In John 4, a woman. That woman came. No name. So that's pretty derogatory. Verse 30, she touches the hem of Jesus' garments and Jesus says, who touched me? Who? There, there's an individual behind this person. The disciples dehumanize the person. They generalize the touch and say, somebody bumped into you. It could have been anybody, somebody, anybody. Do you notice what's happening? A certain woman, bad woman, she smelled, okay? kind of nasty for society. People backed off from her, that woman. Then Jesus says, who? That's somebody specific. He paid, pays attention to one person. And then comes the disciples and they say, well, somebody, anybody could have touched you. And in verse 34, the healing has taken place and, and Jesus says, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. Do you, do you see what Jesus is doing? He rehumanizes a dehumanized human. Does that make sense? He, he puts um, an individuality, an identity back into this poor woman. She's no longer a certain woman. She's no longer who. She's no longer someone. She's no longer anybody could have touched you. She is somebody. And not only somebody, and she's not only healed, she's now a daughter of the prince of the universe. Daughter. You belong 
to my family. She gets healed and she gets adopted. Praise God. That is how Jesus deals with human beings. Quote from uh, Ministry of Healing, page 226. I just, oh, last year finished reading that book with my wife in the evenings. Fascinating book. And what is really intriguing is it is a totally different approach to well-being. Um, there are not very many natural remedies in that book. It is a spiritual approach, faith, and, and the gospel in your life. But uh, Ellen White says, Christ is the same compassionate healer now that he was during his earthly ministry. I think I left out a word. Is the same compassionate healer now that he was doing his earthly ministry. Premise number five. Jesus rehumanizes people. And now the seven doctors plus one, and then I have a practical um, implication of all this. How am I going to do this in 30 minutes next week? I'll have to practice some more. There are seven doctors plus one in the book, ancient book, Ministry of Healing. What are those seven doctors plus one? What I find really intriguing and striking about these seven doctors is they are cheap, accessible to most people, readily available, and they are simple. They are fresh air, sunshine, not smoking, uh, abstinence from bad products, rest, exercise, movement, activity, a good diet, clean water, and trust in God. So here's the famous quote, Ministry of Healing 127. And I'm, I'm not just telling you this, I'm trying to practice these the best I can in my own personal life setting. I'm, uh, this is a bad expression in English, but I'm betting the farm on this. This, this, I believe, works. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, abstinence from bad substances, rest, and a, a balanced diet. You can eat too much of a good thing, too, is in abstemiousness. Real rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, Trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. You don't have to buy anything except hold some food. And that can be a challenge in some areas of the world. Same with clean water. But uh, in general, in the Western world, we have access to these seven doctors and can make the choice to include doctor number one, God himself. Ministry of Healing 251, nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings as much as a duty as it is to pray. If we're heaven bound, how can we go as a band of mourners groaning and complaining all along the way to our father's house? And I have to read that to myself uh, every so often because it feels kind of good when you have a pity party and you're sorry for yourself. Right? You've been mistreated, a life is unfair and this and that and this and that and, and you wallow in your own sorrow and you feel sorry for yourself. And so before I get out of bed um, and I practice sunshine today, fresh air, ate a healthy breakfast, drank water, prayed, um, did that did that today. Before I get out of bed, I tell myself myself, positive attitude, no matter what, regardless of circumstances, um, it's up to me. I can have a cheerful disposition, regardless of what is happening in the world and in life. I'm not taking the suffering of the world lightly or, or just smiling at, at everything. No, no, there's a seriousness behind this positive attitude. It's not flippant or, or surface or casual um, 
or cheap, but your inner uh, attitude towards life and God can be positive daily. Gratitude, rejoicing, benevolence, kindness, trust in God's love and care. These are health's greatest safeguards. Ministry of Healing 281. And uh, the average Adventist, long time ago in the 70s, 80s, they did a study, lived 10 years longer than the rest of the world. I don't know if that's true anymore. Loma Linda University is doing a follow-up study. I'm part of it. They send me a questionnaire every now and then. Uh, but my theory is that if you increase the quality of your life, which is accessible to you within your means, what you can change in your life, if you increase the quality of your life, you will also increase the quantity of your life. That is premise number six. Quality and quantity go hand in hand. Now, there's one more aspect to health that I wish to address. And it's an important one, and it has worked well in my personal life and in ministry. Check your chat. The here, hang on, Danny. The quote on that we must resist melancholy, um, and I have a melancholic strand in me. I have to actively fight against it. I'm I'm honest with you. I I found it helps people when I'm transparent. I'm I'm a very joyful person, happy childhood. <laughs> I was a happy child, but. I can also allow circumstances to really drag me down and I have to decide against it. That quote is from Ministry of Healing 251 and 281. Ministry of Healing 251 and 281. This final aspect is, is mission critical. What I'm observing around me, we can live healthy. We can stop smoking, be vegetarian or vegan, drink clean water. There, there is an aspect that we need to address within the health message. And I, I'm afraid it gets neglected. In the recent years, we're a little more conscious and aware of that. And that is relationships. Our interpersonal relationships, human to human. And as a pastor, years ago, I've developed a method. I have not always successfully practiced my own counsel to myself, but I think it's a method that works. It is simple. It's easy to remember. And it is amazing when I actually practice it myself. There are five steps. And in English, they all start with L. And I even managed to make it start with L in German. I don't know how that would work in Norsk, but um, positive interactions. Number one, love. Genuinely love. Now, love gets abused and uh, used in the wrong way, but appropriate, gentle, kind love in our interactions with people. I was a hospice chaplain. That's okay. We, we can filter that out later. It's somebody's mic. Feedback. No problem. When I was a hospice chaplain, I visited people that some of them were dying because of old age and various circumstances, but some were dying, losing their life because of poor life's choices, really bad life choices. Young people, 28, 30, 34 years old, and life was over for them drug overdose, alcohol, transmitted diseases. And I determined that I, I need to know the details, some of them of the story to deal with them, but I also don't need to know. It doesn't matter. It does not matter what you have done. I will approach you and visit you and spend time with you. That's two minutes, 10 minutes, or two hours, or two days. And I will approach you with unconditional love, especially if you don't deserve it. 
If you've done things that have ruined your life and relationships around you, my premise and promise number one is I will love you. And by love, I mean the gift from God. Because in 1 Corinthians 13, love is a gift given from God. Okay, I, I don't have it. Not coming from me. It's a gift. And I'm not a bucket. I'm a pipeline. And that love is, God's love is passed on to you through me. I have not always practiced that. And the results are catastrophic. But I think as a Christian, the fundamental approach from one person to another is I will love this person no matter what. I see this demonstrated in the life of Christ, and it makes a huge difference. I was invited to the bedside of a young lady who had drunk herself to death. She was still alive, was sent home by the doctors. The liver failure and jaundice and yellow was all over, and she had five days or less. And appropriately, by her invitation, I held her hand as she was dying, did not judge her, did not give her a lecture on drinking too much. What she needed was a last chance to see unconditional, kind, appropriate love. The, the second step is, I will show you the document in a, in a minute again, is number two is listen. We have two ears and one mouth. And in my observation, I have found sometimes you need to speak. There's a time to say something, but it is worth gold to sit with a person and to listen to them without cell phone, with undivided attention, and, and be part of their lives. In order to step number three, learn something about them. And my goal in ministry has always been that I never, ever preach a funeral or a wedding. <laughs> like, what? That's right. I do a lot of funerals and weddings, but what I want to do is that person's funeral. Not a funeral, but your funeral, your wedding. And so I try to avoid pulling papers out of my filing cabinet. My filing cabinet is right there. Many weddings, many funerals, but I, I don't want to just copy somebody else's 10, 20 minutes that I speak at a funeral or wedding. I want to learn enough where I can speak about this person and nobody else. So, so I love unconditionally. I learn. I listen in order to learn. Step number four, to lead. If appropriate, to lead a person the next step. Do they need to quit smoking? It might not be time for that. Do they need to, whatever it might be, do they need food? I've seen families without food in the fridge. I run to Aldi. Do you have Aldi in Norway? And, and just buy food. They didn't need a sermon at that point. They just needed food. Uh, what does the person in front of me need? What would they benefit from appropriately from my life, my resources in their life? And I cannot superimpose my standards and and values of not smoking onto a smoker immediately. You need to quit smoking. They do need to quit smoking, but it might not be time for that. If it is time, how can I help them quit smoking? I'm, I'm talking from real scenarios. What would be best for that person to take the next step? Not my next step, but their next step. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm focused on the person, what's best for the person. And then uh, leave. And by that, I mean not just leaving, and we're almost done and I'm leaving. <laughs> but what do I leave behind? I have to, in German, we say Fingerspitzengefühl. <laughs> what is that? A feeling in the tip of your fingers. When is it time to leave? And I, I have left too soon with some people, and sometimes I've stayed too long measuring the time just right, how long to stay with a person 
And then as you leave, to leave something behind. And for me, that's little stuffed animals. I've bought them by the thousands. Uh, greeting cards that I've made myself sometimes from pictures, a uh, church bulletin, business card, a drawing. I've done that hundreds of times with especially dying patients. Uh, leaving something for the family. Why? I learned it from Jesus. He did something without being physically present. Now, I'm not Jesus. I would like to be more like Jesus. But he did something without being present. And I want to leave something behind for my human interaction where something positive, constructive lingers after I'm gone, after I left the visit, after I'm dead, um, after I no longer see that person, they need to have something tangible, something positive. So that's that's my system and it has worked well. It is to love, to listen, to learn, to lead, and to leave something from all this behind for that person. And I would say um, working on personal relationships maybe has had the most profound impact on health too. Relationships are so complicated. We as people are so difficult. And I've always told people, if you think that somebody else is difficult in your life, that means somebody else thinks that you are difficult, okay? and that Ingo is difficult to deal with. Um, my premise number seven is we live to love and to love is to live. Uh, third John chapter two, and then I will close with a question for you. Um, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Third John uh, it's chapter one, verse two. There's only one chapter. And my question to you is, uh, John five, verse six, do you want to be made well? That seems like a rhetorical question. I don't think it is. I think it is a probing into that person's faith at the pool of Bethesda. Do you want to be made well? And the question really is, do you think that I, Jesus, can restore your health. Unfortunately, this side of heaven, health is not always restored. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, which might have been his eyesight. Ellen White suffered from poor health to keep her humble. She prayed, she would speak, it would all go away. She had symptoms like heart attacks, chest pressure, feeling sick, and God sustained her. So we, we don't always know the whole equation in, in God's plan. But I pray that this um, these seven steps here make sense and are practically positive in your life. Take an intense interest in individuals and aim for a positive Permanence. So the Bible is holistic, I think, with Shalom and all these Bible texts and, and in Jesus' ministry, teaching, preaching, and healing. Jesus himself practiced whole person care. When he heals, he saves. Jesus' word is as good as his touch. He rehumanizes people and adopts them into his family. Changing the quality of life in your life or somebody else's life will also increase the quantity of their life and really, when it comes down to it, the essence of life. In the perspective of God is we live to love and to love is to really live. And so I don't know your condition. I don't know your circumstances. Um, but I pray that you might be in good health and I wish you shalom. That's my take on Gesundheit. Whole Thank person you, uh, Ingo. healthcare. 
that was uh, looking at the health message from another uh, view, and uh, it was very, very important and very uh, soothing for the heart to listen to. <laughs> and I think we could have spoken about each point, you know, for a long yes. time. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I was thinking here, a merry heart is good like a medicine. That is, um, yeah. I, maybe you were mentioning that verse, but uh, you know, I, when you said that you want to be open, and I appreciate that that you're sharing with us how you sometimes feel inside. And but don't you think when you uh, something happen and this depression or dragging down or what we shall uh, that is a taste temptation, isn't it? Yes. You are thinking it's you. But it is a temptation that the enemy can come from all side to make you depressed that you feel like that. I think That's many right. of us are, you know, somehow uh, coming into this circle of wrong thinking because we don't uh, somehow manage to think that, oh, this is a depression, uh, temptation, and then just wait on the Lord to take it away from you. It it can be physiological, it can be your serotonin level, it can be your thyroid, it can be a toothache, it can be seasonal affective disorder when it's cloudy. In Texas, we have 30 degrees tomorrow, over 30 degrees Celsius. Blue sky and springtime and the flowers are coming back. It brings joy to your life. When you don't have that, that can cause depression. It can also, I think, quote from the Bible, an enemy has done this. Uh, Satan can cause this darkness to come over you. Uh, I think Winston Churchill called it the black dog. It's a direct assault by by Satan to get you off track. So multiple right. causes. Uh, I just had a thought. This would the the seven doctors plus one. Eva, you have a lot of programs on these seven doctors plus one. In our evangelism, in our churches, we sometimes have little health snippets. Yeah, two minutes, five minutes, and then we go into Daniel chapter two in prophecy. I think it would be good to develop, and I'm looking at you, Zadok, <laughs> in, in Kenya. I think it would be good to develop a, an evangelistic series, not always built on prophecy and revelation, but built on those seven doctors plus one. So where the health message is the, the emphasis and, and then the spiritual component, of course, as well. But an evangelistic series, what I'm saying is uh, designed around those seven doctors. I think that would make sense to the world. A lot of people know about drinking clean water, rest, in a social media environment, we don't get enough sleep, too many electronics. Uh, evangelism based on the health message. That would be yeah. something to to develop. Well, it's the right arm of the gospel, right? That's right. Yep. Not so, the right fist, but the right arm. Right. <laughs> right. So back to your uh, heart problem. Have you, since you were saying, and I heard that myself, that sometimes heart problems can actually come from the teeth. Did you yes. ever check your teeth? Yes, my, my teeth are fully checked and uh, I don't have uh, mercury in them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I did check that. Um, and, you know, they, I uh, learned the other day also that if you have, now I'm back to this parasites, you know, I talk about, about parasites, but if you have parasites in the liver or in the gallbladder, it can actually cause uh, heart problems, high blood pressure to be yeah. specific. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how we, we think of the body. Well, I go to the dentist for my teeth, the eye doctor for my eyes, but we are an interconnected system. Right. And and one, one organ, one area can affect, affect another. No. You know, it might be when you have this uh, meeting in this uh, health, uh, what do you call it again, health forum, that yeah. when you speak about uh, if you go to a restaurant 
and by meat, it can be blood in it. It you can get this question, you know, when you when we are eating uh, meat, even if you have it at home. I mean, it is blood in this, isn't it? That's right. And a lot of people, including Adventists, now my my they like to eat their meat medium rare. And I, I've seen people cut into their meat and you can still see the blood. It is still reddish and a liquid. My dad, when I grew up, I grew up on everything that moved, had a face and a mom. My dad liked his meat in French, bien cuit. Well done. That's on, on level five. Uh, almost black on the outside. He wanted his meat cooked all the way through. And it did not look bloody. But what, what I'm seeing on advertisements and in personal observation, um, people say that's where the flavor is. Mm -hmm. And it looks like to me that Acts 15 is still in effect. Uh, it's not canceled, that that is a violation of New Testament counsel. And uh, we, we don't like to hear that. That is stepping on people's toes or plates. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, someone else have some questions or comments. Yeah, Vern, please. Well, I wanted to comment on a couple of things, but one, uh, just what Ingo said there, um, you're sure bang on on that. I brought that up uh, a number of times, and, and I get more pushback from leadership than anyone else because, you know, the, the, the first question is, what is unclean? It's not just the animal but how the meat is prepared, how they slaughter, how it is drained. Um, I dare to say, I tell most people, 99% of what crosses their palate in the form of meat is unclean, regardless of what they think. Because unless it comes from a Jewish uh, slaughterhouse, where it is prepared according to scriptural description, it's unclean. It's got the blood and the fat. Uh, and and as, as Ingo said, it's all about the taste. They find it unsavory that we mention these things, but the real problem is savory. It's their taste buds. The taste bud is demented. Uh, I learned not too long after giving up eating meat, um, well, at the time of giving it up, how tasteless properly prepared meat actually is. Uh, boil it, boil it, you know, drain it well and then boil it before you uh, sear it. And unless you've got lots of herbs and spices with it, it's like chewing on that moth you were talking about, Ingo. There's... There's not much to it. Most people would not be attracted to meats. We found when we become vegetarian that the it was the herbs and, and the uh, savory items that were added that we were actually attracted to. I, I had no I had no problem with quitting meat. And I found I could get that same flavor uh, by cooking various uh, foods together and grains and stuff. That's all that mattered to me. I never looked back. But it it's it's not well received. What I wanted to, before I may let you comment on that, but what I wanted to... Uh, bring to mind was you mentioned going to Alberta in uh, April and right. just just a few days after we spoke I got a phone call out of the blue it was my office forwarded a call to me and I said yes I'll take the call I recognized the name I hadn't talked to the gentleman in over 20 years he used to be one of our head elders uh, a gentleman whom I sat under his teaching and thoroughly enjoyed but it had been indicated to us that truth about God was of not interest to him he'd pushed back at it well, he called me and said he's been trying to track me down for months. He had heard me speaking on one of these here and said, well, hang on a second. I know that name. I know that person. And he just couldn't find me. He finally tracked me down through a search for employers and employees, and he found me listed as the administrator where I work. The beauty of this is, is that over 30 years ago, he saw that truth. He says, in fact, I have to be fully honest. I saw it in 1957, but couldn't see that it, not. Nah, it just, it couldn't, the church couldn't do that. And he said a number of years ago, um, it, he just couldn't push it back anymore. It kept jumping out at him and jumping and coming up everywhere that he, his mind just couldn't agree with it. So he went off on a multi-year trail of studying catalog, studying everything. And he said, the more I read, the more convicted I could be. And then I, he said, I heard you talking on there. And I thought there was myself and a few others that were in this place. And I said, well, be encouraged. There are people all over the world that understand this truth. And uh, he was calling because he said, well, I heard you speak. Do you know Ingo Sorky? And I said, I have spoken with Ingo recently, actually. And he said, well, did you know he's coming to Alberta? 
I said, I ah, yes, I did. Did you know he's coming to BC? He <laughs> so, to yeah, he used to come to our services here at the, at the mission, and uh, he attended there for quite a few years. And then, but he's 82 years of age, and he says that he uh, he will be coming there. The neat and interesting thing, this is how the mind works, and this I wanted to share this with you, Ingo, and the others, is one of the students that I mentioned, one of my students I mentioned quite frequently that we had a strange with came back from a similar thing. This gentleman, he had bumped into each other at camp meeting five years ago. He had written the contact information down uh, for this older gentleman and then promptly forgot he got it. Well, when I told him the other day that, hey, you remember how I bumped into the other day? I bumped into Keith. He said, oh, really? He said, oh, I haven't talked to him since 2018. So he got his number off me, plugged it in his phone, the number come up. He already had it in there from 2018 and didn't know it. He gets a hold of Keith and he says, and Keith says, well, I don't remember you. He says, oh, come on, you must remember me. I was a student at the school. I talked to you at camp meeting in 2018. He says, no, I can't place you. He says, well, would have, you remember me better if you remember if I reminded you I borrowed some books from you? Oh, now I know you. He named both books and the authors, <laughs> yet he couldn't remember the student. And the students so awesome. It's interesting how the mind works because that was over 20 years ago. And yet he could remember that those two books had never been returned uh, and who their author and what the title was. So uh, to me, we're, we're so mysteriously, wonderfully made because this man at 82 has a mind like a you know a trap, but he couldn't remember that detail. So he says he will see you there. Um, looking forward to that because this is a gentleman we never, ever uh, perceived would accept the message, but uh, you know he is he is known about the truth since 1957, but couldn't push himself to going down that path, knowing that it would isolate him. Because, and uh, he said it's brought him to talks with a, a number of people uh, in the divisions here that uh, he's really praying that uh, he will be able to touch their hearts on the truth about the Father and the Sons. Okay. There you go. Maybe you would like to pray to our dear Jesus. Yes. Um, doctor number one. Yes, amen. Yeah. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the health message, the healing ministry of Christ. We thank you for that. We, we come to you with our burdens, with our sadness, with our feelings, challenges. And we come to you with the people around us that are struggling and are sick, and as we say in English, uh, groping in the dark. Grant us your light, not the light of the world, and your method, and your message. I want to pray for this group for wellness, beyond just health, a sense of shalom. Mm -hmm. And Norway... Canada, Italy, the U.S. here now, anywhere in the world. And that these insights don't just lead to a better life, to a, but to a better witness and connection to the people around us. Above anything else, grant us your love. Um, mm -hmm. Romans 5.5, 5, you have put this love in our hearts. May we love people intensely, appropriately before the end. <clears throat> Grant us your blessing, not just for life, but how to live, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.